Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week, we gather and share ideas related to innovation, entrepreneurship, and education in the realm of service above self. Why service above self? Because we're a Rotary Club, and we believe we can make the world a much better place. And if you disagree with us, you're wrong. So what we're hoping to do is to share the kind of ideas that inspire you to see new possibilities for how you might be improving your community, working with others to make cool things happen along these lines. And so in doing this, we can, we can get speakers from anywhere because we have this kind of wonderful little thing called the Internet, and it allows us to connect with people uh, who are doing wonderful things wherever they are in order to inspire people everywhere else. And our speaker today is Ian Pollock of the California State University, East Bay, and he is the director of their, of their graduate multimedia program. Now, this is a program we're going to hear a lot about, but uh, a little, little bit more about Ian. He is an activist, an artist, and an educator, and his areas of interest include, get rid of this, neuroscience and game making, creative team building, using technology to map intrinsic bias, and a guerrilla grafting. That's G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A, -L -L grafting. And so uh, if you don't mention that, Ian, you know it's going to be the first question. So, group, I would like you to, to welcome Ian Pollock. I feel like I'm on my own sitcom now. Okay, so, well, welcome everybody. I'm 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 pleased that you invited me to speak, and I'm grateful for it. And um, uh, at some point, uh, we we were talking about the graduate program, and so maybe I can lead off with that, and I can talk a little bit about sort of why I'm interested in this graduate program. It's really a, uh, maybe it's the first of these kinds of graduate programs in the country. It was established in 1992 when multimedia was just kind of emerging, uh, right? Like I think most web pages still were kind of gray with blue links, if you sort of remember that time. And um, and so that's when, when this whole thing sort of got started. And of course now we're in 2015 and, and the world looks very different. And so what multimedia means is really different, and uh, I think that that here at Cal State East Bay we we try to sort of explore the 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 way in which you can you can stretch and malform that term to sort of incorporate all of these amazing things that are now available in technology. So the internet is really ubiquitous, right? We we don't even really think about uh, being online anymore because we just always are online. So it's not necessarily a special condition anymore in a way, the way it used to be. Uh, and so we try to sort of think about, well, if if the if we're still telling each other stories, but we're not looking at big monolithic room-sized monitors anymore. Um, I think computers now fit into not even our, just it's not even the back pocket anymore, right? It's sort of like we, we wear them in our ear or uh, we have them on a ring, right? Like these these chips are getting smaller and smaller. We can sew them into clothing. And so, what does that mean for the future of of interactive content? So that's really kind of where we're sort of playing, investigating, researching at this university. So I thought that I would maybe talk a little bit about what the graduate program is, what what um, what we do here, and I thought that I would maybe lead off with a with a with a video clip and because of um, uh, our setup here, you won't be able to hear the sound, and the sound is a sort of a droning, uh, very, very pleasant sound. But what I'll do is I'm going to switch over to, uh, to this video right now, and I'll play it, and I'll just kind of talk over it while, while it's playing and kind of explain what's going on. And then I think we, we, we're going to have a, a web page, and you're going to be able to post some links, and you'll be able to see the video in its, in its full length and, and some other things as well. So let me, let me switch over here and, uh, and do that. So here we go. OK. So uh, let me also go full screen here. Uh, and there we go. So uh, what you see here is called the sand noise device. And um, it's one of the thesis projects of our graduate students from two years ago, which were mostly musicians. There were three musicians and one sculptor. And they thought, 
we all teach music for a living and one of the hardest things, one of the most challenging things and one of the most fear inspiring things for most people is to, to have to pick up an instrument and to learn how to play it like a tuba or a saxophone or a guitar. And so, and so together they thought, well, what would an instrument look like that would be so intuitive and so natural to play that everybody would just sort of know how to play it before they even started experimenting with making sounds. And so they developed a sandbox. And there are sensors in that sandbox and a projection that's mapped onto the sand. And as you move the sand around, the, 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 the sound modulates based on the topography of the sand. And so that's kind of what you're seeing here, and you're seeing our, our group here. And this was uh, a video that was made by the Maker Fair, which sort of takes projects that they think are particularly interesting, and they, they create kind of feature featurettes to sort of highlight um, what they do. So let me, uh, let me come back here. Um, and let's see. I should be, sorry, my apologies, let me, how do I get back? There we are, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, what we do here essentially is experimentation and interactive content. And I have a couple of slides to sort of highlight what we do and then uh, I'll go, uh, we'll, we'll go over. So let me go to my slides and um, share those with you. Okay, here we go. And okay, so here you see the um, the sand noise device again, uh, as it was displayed at the Moogfest, and the Moogfest is a is an annual conference by uh, in South Carolina, connected to the Moog company, which is of course the first synthesizer and so these guys were invited to perform their piece there and people like Einstein Neubauten and Kraftwerk and Laurie Anderson came to look at their project and were really excited by it. So really what we're doing is we're developing interactive content in many different ways and so we invite people to come and uh, from different backgrounds, really from engineering, from music, from art, from English literature, we, we try to get people together and then we make teams out of these groups and they build these projects together. So here's the sand noise device. Uh, and so it's really about collaboration and collegiality, which I think is really important in this kind of 21st century. It's a, it's a way for people to hone these skills that are often considered secondary, right? We sometimes call them soft skills, but essentially, uh, more importantly, I think they're really key skills in this sort of modern era that we find ourselves, being able to work together, being able to imagine things that haven't been created yet, and, uh, and then building prototypes. So, right, creativity is the, is the ultimate economic resource. I think we, living in the valley, we see what creativity can uh, cause. We, we're living in this sort of, uh, I think, really a sort of a renaissance of, of post-information technology, things that are now being sort of explored. Uh, and, and sort of the, 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 the way in which people can come together in this kind of new social way, right? That, that I think the, the social capital and the creative capital are really two huge forces that, that are kind of influencing us today. Uh, and so to this end, we really have a kind of a workshop here. It's a kind of 24 hours, seven day access. And we really try to sort of push people to, to, to discover their limits and then to sort of go beyond them. Um, we're really interested in creating uh, teams that, that go across gender, that go across ethnicity and race, that go across age to sort of see what is it that we can create together when we bring together people that are really different from each other. Uh, I think that that's really the key to sort of a, a, a sustainable future in the kind of the broadest sense, so not just environmentally sustainable, but, but also socioeconomically sustainable. Uh, I think that we have to find ways to be able to work and live and invent together. Uh, this is a machine by 
uh, an artist uh, at the New York Museum of Modern Art and this machine destroyed itself. So we try to make machines that don't destroy us but in fact enhance what we do. We try to build creative capital uh, which is a sort of a capital that you can spend without depleting it um, and it is really something that, that has to be sort of built, I think, rather than uh, discovered. I think that, that there's sometimes a failed notion that, that creativity is something that you either have or you don't have. There are actually ways, I think, that we can sort of encourage people to think more creatively, to be more creatively in the world, and to look at their surroundings with an eye of an artist and an inventor. We have some pretty good facilities here with laser cutters and uh, we work with undergraduate and graduate students to sort of bring people into this kind of new world of rapid prototyping and fabrication. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that we build gets gets written up. So we have we have some pretty we have a pretty good track record of getting people into into magazines and into, into um, news segments with the kinds of things that we build here. So with that, I sort of want to I want to kind of encourage you to to join the creative class and to uh, to join us uh, and to sort of think about how we can transform the environment we live in by by this first transformation, which is our own transformation, and to sort of look at creativity and innovation and the way in which we can foster those skills in us. So that was really, I think, kind of a quick overview of what I wanted to share in terms of this. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm always... There we go. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so the, 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 this program has been around for a while and uh, I now uh, serve as the coordinator or the director of this program. We're now in the recruitment phase. We try to get people in by June 30th so that it could start in the fall uh, and uh, really kind of curate the cohort and it's a sort of two-year program. My interest really I think into this was kind of from my own practice. So I, uh, I studied at the San Francisco Art Institute uh, in new genre uh, at a time when computers were just kind of coming online uh, and I also got my my master's degree in art practice from Cal Berkeley and I think that if you look in this area you see that a lot of these institutions like Cal Berkeley with the Berkeley Center for New Media Research the Santa Cruz uh, uh, digital art new media program you see that there's a lot of interest in the way in which um, institutions can anchor these sort of creative endeavors. So traditionally things I think were more in, uh, existing in silos and what we try to do here now and what attracted me to this place was really the way in which we can co uh, combine science, technology, engineering, math and the arts. So turning STEM into STEAM and really kind of uh, uh, moving forward with that. So we've done some really interesting experiments here. The graduate program is one of them. We're also running a, an after-school program that explores neuroscience and game making because uh, the way we perceive the world, of course, is, is, is governed by our brain. Our, our, our brain tells fabulous fictions of, uh, based on the input that we receive, right? The first, the, the first fiction, of course, is that the world looks right side up, whereas our eyes see it upside down. Uh, and uh, we don't see the color of, of, of light, right? So, but if we have a camera and it doesn't correct, it doesn't sort of say, well, no, this is really white, right? If it's not white balanced, suddenly the room looks orange or it looks green or it looks blue. So, so our brains are tremendously involved in everything we experience. And so uh, we think that there's a way in which we can look at interactive experiences, uh, uh, teaching how to make them, but then at the same time, looking at the underlying mechanisms that that give a, that explain why we feel pleasure when we succeed in something for example so that's this connection to to neuroscience and we've uh, we've done one round now of this this pilot program we're hoping to do a second one I think it's been pretty interesting um, I'm also interested in in finding ways in which things kind of come together so that's that was the the gorilla grafting that that you alluded to so 
uh, it's a it's a project that I'm involved in with some other people, and uh, we basically go out into the community and we teach people how to graft, which is this thousand thousand year old technique of taking a branch from one tree and uh, connecting it to another. Every every California wine is the result of people smuggling scions in their boots from France and from Argentina, and then growing them in the hills of California by grafting them onto California roots and rootstock. So we do the same thing except that we encourage people to look at the, um, the sterile fruit trees in urban spaces, so sterile cherries, sterile plums, and sterile pears, and to convert them back into fruit trees. Gorilla, of course, because there is some question as to whether or not um, uh, this is something that cities want to encourage. So in the in the old model, I think we we try to separate the gentry from the country, and so cities were kind of considered non-producing spaces. Until very recently, you couldn't grow things in in the front lawn of your of your house, right? You couldn't just grow some corn in the front lawn because there was sort of a property value question there or an urban question there, and so we want to. Governor Brown has 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 overturned that, right? He's kind of opened that door, and we want to sort of push that idea further and to say, well, why can't we walk down Main Street and and really walk down a, a, a street that's lined with apple trees and and that could feed people where they live, so we don't have to import everything from uh, Chile or or from the Central Valley. Why can't we have some healthy food right where we live and have thriving uh, uh, ecosystems where we live? So, so that's sort of maybe an outline. I realize that this is a quite a quite a short talk, and I um, I want to sort of maybe open it up and 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 see if maybe there's some questions. I think that that Perfect. might be better. Well, I, I love that uh, that you finished your your presentation time with a story about about grafting grapes. You know, you know this kind of thing because. I think one of the things that, uh, that that comes to my mind when I when I think about the things that you talk about in your graduate program is the is the importance of being able to tell a story in some effective way. That I, I use that both because it's my interest and it's also kind of an opportunity uh, to introduce the group that we have at the bottom of the screen. So uh, I'll get get you guys to wave as as we as we hit there. But uh, Shag Shagrin, our our. our uh, membership chair for the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley and a, a member of the California Storytellers uh, Network. I can, I, he can give you the exact exact term there. Oh, fantastic. Uh, oh, yeah. And then we've got uh, John Lozano, a, uh, a photographer, and which means he's, he's a visual storyteller, and a talented educator uh, and a person who works with uh, children's leadership programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have with us uh, David Goodstone. From uh, who's in Illinois in in the Evanston area, uh, he works with Rotary International and is a part of the team that works to help people understand the stories of service to others that Rotary is all about. So so when we think about when we think about telling stories, right? Uh, whether someone is is thought of as a you know kind of far left wing artsy you know whatever. Or, or a hard-nosed, you know, kind of, you know, all, all about capitalism person. Every organization needs somebody that can effectively tell their stories. That's for and, sure, yeah. And so looking at the kinds of technologies that are now available, do you, do you find that you're getting people from all across the college? You talked about graduates and undergraduates, but I, I'm guessing you have a lot of people coming into the program who are studying other things as well. In fact, you know, one could say that maybe in a way, the, when you think of a MA in multimedia, you would think that that most of the people that come are artists, and and that actually isn't necessarily the case. We have we have people really from all kinds of disciplines, kind of sort of coming in to to explore what happens when you when you come together with people that are not in your discipline. And I'm really involved at this campus to to encourage all not just in the graduate program to encourage these kind of transdisciplinary ways of working so that there are things that storytellers can learn from chemists and chemists can learn from storytellers, right? That, there, that there's this kind of need, in fact, uh, to, to look at these isolated disciplines with which we've grown up and to sort of realize that, that very few things come from a single discipline, that most of the things that we surround ourselves with are, are really hybrids, they're really grafted technologies, right? They're sort of things that have been combined and recombined 
that involve uh, people from from different skill sets, and and I think the most effective stories, the most effective uh, even technologies that we use, sort of incorporate knowledge from these different branches. Um, Very cool. I want to be able to uh, let our, our our team chime in as well. Yes, of course. Uh, so with that. Uh, let me see who we've got uh, lining up for a question or a comment. Uh, John, go ahead. Great, uh, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. It's oh, thank you. Very interesting, and it's here in the Bay Area, which makes it that much cooler for me. Um, but with that said, you talked about uh, different diverse groups in which you have working together, and it yeah. sounds like it's different different areas of music and on and on. Have you? thought about different ages because I, I mean I work at a middle school who have very creative kids who always are on the computer coming up with new ideas and maybe you would look at that being with a pairing with a musician or somebody in the gaming you talked about the after school program and yeah maybe you could for talk sure. about how that kind of translates into the school arena a uh, place where you have such creative ideas what what do you think would be something that would be working at at your site yeah, so so we have a couple of interesting things there because I mean, first of all, I think a master's program. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things to realize. So so CSU East Bay. Uh, interesting side note might be that uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education has a list of of diversity in in universities, and um, Cal State East Bay is the fifth on that list and has been, and the other four are all in Hawaii. So, so just in terms of who is at this university, right? Like, there's a, it's a really different student body from, for example, Cal Berkeley, from UC Santa Cruz. It is, it is really a, a, a an incredibly diverse group of people that are here. Uh, and then, of course, it is an undergraduate and a graduate program. So we do have, kind of, uh, the the people that are just getting started and the people that. Um, sort of want to upgrade their skills, and then people that have been working for a while, and and you know, their either their careers are coming to an end, right? Like like certain jobs just disappear, and they have to re refocus, or maybe it's just a time when when it's time for personal change and and for personal growth, and you want to sort of embrace that. So we do have some diversity in terms of age in our program. And then what I've tried to do, uh, what I've been interested in is, um, so I run a, a quarterly event here called Game Jam, and it's it's basically rapid prototyping games over the course of a 54-hour weekend, and um, and it's really mostly undergraduate students. Uh, but out of that came this this other program that, that I was mentioning before, which is this after-school program with neuroscience and game making called Brain Jam. Uh, and um, so from Brain Bee, which is a neuroscience kind of spelling bee national competition and game jam. And so what we've done with that is that that uh, we train or I work with some people to to orient our students here, our undergraduate students, into game making and also into uh, a biology professor into uh, into neuroscience. And then we send our students into the high school to be the after-school program tutors. And so we're creating, we're trying to sort of create these kind of near-peer experiences, so that right we, we teach graduate students and to some degree uh, and also undergraduate students, and then the graduate and undergraduate students are teaching high school students. And there is sort of a fantasy, and it you know at this point really it's it's just that to to figure out if there's a way to then send the high school students into a middle school, to sort of always to 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 both uh, realize that that we learn by being exposed to a teacher, but we also learn much more if we have to try to teach somebody else. And and so the the practice of teaching, I think, is a hugely transformative thing in in my life uh, uh, and and also in other people's lives that I see as a as kind of a a, a real force there. Great, great. Sounds very exciting. Thanks. Shags. Very interesting program, and I, I love the connection to neuroscience. I work with a in an area called money coaching, which is bridging the gap between psychology and financial practicality. And in yeah. there, people get lost because of the neuroscience of what goes on in their brain. I would love for us at the Money Coaching Institute to be able to give for our clientele, and even with our coaches, a game where they can 
make real money decisions and see which archetypes yeah. and neuro uh, neural pathways are being triggered by their decisions because people are making mistakes around money and they, they haven't had practice. Yeah, for That's sure. the big thing. They, yeah. they teach us how to make change in school, they teach us about taxes, but they don't talk to us about emotions and money and how it influences our relationships and, and the way we drive ourselves through the world, how we feel valued or undervalued in the world, and to be able to have some sort of a, of a tactical approach would be fascinating. I got to mute because my wife just got home and it's sure. getting noisy. Well, it's interesting that you that you bring that up actually because um, we bring in uh, we have a um, a speaker series in our graduate program and we bring in people and we recently brought in uh, Alfred Tu, who is a who is a Bay Area architect who also makes board games and uh, the most recent board game and these are not normal board games, so this is this is what this is to your point. Uh, that he looks at really complex systems, and he looks at board games, and then the way that they can they can serve to understand complex issues. So he has a um, his most recent board game, which was also in the news uh, featured uh, recently in the news, is called Bay Area Regional Planner. So it's a right. It's a it's a it's a riveting title for a board game, as you can as as you might think. But basically, what he's tried to do is to look at zoning and to look at housing demand and commuting times and to create essentially a consensus-based, not a turn-based game, where people have to come to some consensus as to where in the Bay Area you would develop in order to address the housing need. Uh, and then to to build enough housing to lower the rents and at the same time build in such a way that it doesn't increase the commute time beyond, for example, 40 minutes, which is sort of I think a common uh, common sort of a number, right? Like that's where it becomes painful. So it's really it's a it's a really uh, interesting way to sort of think about how games can actually uh, uh, create these these really complex interactions that that let us kind of see and understand complex systems and in fact I think that we right you could sort of say that that much of what we do when we grow up is we, we're sort of playing roles out and we're kind of exploring how they land right and so I mean the difference between play and game is is, is sort of the set of rules and and the space right so we can be playful all the time but if we're playing a game then there's sort of this this framing in time and space right and and maybe there's a rule set uh, and um, I think it's also interesting to to realize that there are some people at, at UC Berkeley that are doing research in altruism, and and they actually did some really interesting things around monopoly, where they uh, they started some people off with twice the amount of resources, twice the amount of money, and somebody else with half the amount of money, and they discovered that the people that had twice the money became very ornery, and sort of bossy, uh, and. And that sort of was, was one insight. But then the interesting thing was that then they reversed the roles, and then they reversed the roles again. And what had happened was that someone who had played with a, a financial deficit for a while, so had been exposed, quote unquote, to poverty, when they mm -hmm. came into money, actually their relationship to money and to people that didn't have money ch had changed. So it was a really interesting transformation transformation that happened, and in that same line, right? They 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 researched this this thing around cars, right? So so the people that drive really expensive cars are more likely to break certain kinds of traffic laws, uh, irrespective of of income. So so people that don't have a lot of money but that buy a nice car drive similar to people that have a lot of money and drive a nice car, versus people that don't drive really nice cars either poor or rich and and how they relate to the kind of the 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 the, the laws of the road so there's a there's a really interesting interesting uh, kind of research that's coming out uh, out uh, from Berkeley around those kind of issues it's it's fantastic you should definitely look at that and i think it has to do with the way that our brain sort of Right, like the, the the memory of 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 certain kinds of experiences and certain af affinities and affiliations. I think it's it's very much about how your brain works. Well, I'm thinking that we can take that discussion in a lot of different directions. Um, sure. I'll, I'll hold back, you know, from from uh, from from a time point of view. But but first, uh, I want to say that um, before I wind things down, uh, as always, I'll give Ian the last word. Uh, if he's got a good thought to share, you know, just to encourage our our members and our guests from around the world, uh, you know, with, along any particular lines, so, you know, he'll have that chance. 
for everybody who has joined us, uh, first thanks to all of all of the participants in, in the room, to Shags and to John and to David, um, and and all of you who are watching this now. There are a couple things we want you to do uh, as you finish this portion of our meeting. When you finish this video and scroll down the page a little, you're going to see. Uh, a place to let us know you were there. We always ask for you to, to, to tell us that you participated. Uh, and all you have to do is really just kind of give us a, uh, you know, your name and email. If you are a, and we're not going to spam you, um, but if you are a visiting Rotarian, uh, then, then doing that properly will generate an email that you will receive and can pass along to your club secretary for making up a missed meeting uh, at, at some other point. Uh, and we encourage you to always see us as an option because every Rotarian can be a 100% attender given how easy it is to make up a mist using something like the Rotary Club of Silicon Valley. Ding. Now, uh, the other thing we ask you to do uh, is to go down to the Discuss section, the D-I-S-Q-U-S. Uh, when we talk about the idea of bringing a lot of people from different backgrounds together to look at, 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 at art in new ways, at, at arts expression for us to think about new, you know, different, different challenges we face in new ways, we're talking about communicating effectively. And one of the powerful pieces of our club is that anyone who comes and visits is invited to tell us, what do you think? What did you think of this, this program? What do you think of our meeting? You know, how can we improve? We, we welcome feedback on, on what we're doing as an e-club uh, with our website and with how we bring different pieces of media together to, to share a, a meeting each and every week. So with that, I want to thank everyone for being part, uh, and I will pass along to Ian our last thought. Great, thank you. So um, I guess I should I should start by by saying that if if you're interested in the graduate multimedia program, you should check out multimedia.csueastbay.edu, and and we'll post some links on underneath this talk, I believe. Um, so you can check that out, and and maybe uh, so. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm scrolling through the, the 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 database of profound thoughts, and I thought that uh, maybe I should end with a um, an education quote, and and uh, so I'll I'll paraphrase Alvin Tuffler, who said that in the past century, those who were successful were the ones that could read and write, and I think we've you know many of us have grown up with that idea. Uh, and uh, then he continued uh, to say that in this new in this new era that we find ourselves in. Really, the ones who will be successful are the ones that can learn, unlearn, and relearn. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think sort of maybe maybe with that, uh, uh, I, I would leave you all and and sort of think about you know what are the things that you've learned, what are the things that you might want to unlearn, and what are the things that that I think all of us will really need to relearn in terms of in terms of how we proceed into this into this 21st century. Wonderful. We look forward to seeing you <laughs> next week at Rotary, uh, the Rotary Club of Silicon Valley at siliconvalleyrotary.com. Thank you.